Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, here with this week's special conversations episode. Today, I spoke with Elodie Harper, the author of the new novel, The Wolf Den, which is about the women of the Lupinar, the brothel in ancient Pompeii. I really loved this book. It's sort of a divergence from my usual fare of mythology, but so deeply rooted in the ancient world and everything to do with that. Such an interesting look into Pompeii and the women there, specifically women enslaved in a brothel. Now, before you go thinking that this is going to be a super dark novel or gritty or graphic or anything, honestly, it's a really nuanced and interesting and well-told look at just the lives of these women, some of whom, you know, were born into that world, others were brought into it. Um, it's, it's really, it's really well done. And I think a very overall just enjoyable book that gives voice to these women who are sort of otherwise, you know, forgotten or marginalized or various other things. I do highly recommend the book in general. The book comes out on May 13th in the UK, though those of us, many of those of us at least, beyond the UK can order it online from a few different places. Uh, We found out that uh, Blackwell's, the bookseller out of the UK, has free shipping in some cases to the US and are shipping elsewhere as well. Um, Waterstones in the UK has a very special edition that has some nonfiction material added in. And of course, you know, you can get it on probably very other websites that ship worldwide. I know I will be ordering myself a copy for sure. In today's episode, we talked not only about Elodie's book, but also about Pompeii in general and the women of it in general and sort of some of the history and stuff. It was really fascinating. Uh, We just generally had a really enjoyable conversation. I find that this keeps happening with the people I talk to. I just kind of get along with them really well and just let them talk. And you'll notice in this episode, I did a lot, a particularly large amount of mm mm-hmms. And I think it's just because I was so into it, but I personally noticed it. So I'm going to flag it all for you guys. But generally, really fascinating conversation, really good book. And it was just an absolute joy speaking with Elodie. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Conversations. She Wolves of Pompeii, The Lupinar, The Wolf Den, with Elodie Harper. I am here today with Elodie Harper, the author of the new novel, The Wolf Den, um, which is a bit out of my wheelhouse, but I was really excited to be able to read it anyway. So thank you so much for for talking with me today, Elodie. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm so glad. Um, So just to jump right in with how, I mean, it's, it's definitely in the classical, the ancient world that I obsess over and inhabit in my life but you have focused your book in ancient Rome which is really interesting and specifically in the brothels of Pompeii how just to jump right into that where did you get this idea what made you want to dive into that specific topic yeah I I know that's a question that people do ask because it's quite a left field (laughs) thing to do so I've got a lifelong love of the classics I studied um, Latin literature uh, all the way up to university I did an English literature degree but I did um, a paper uh, on Latin poets as well in in the original language and then obviously read a lot of them in translation and I've always wanted to write about the period but I think it's something I wanted to write about the ancient world I think it's a confidence thing that you build up to as you get older and then you just think I'm just gonna do it and Pompeii is obviously if you're trying to reimagine yourself in the ancient world you can literally walk around there and see the streets as they as they would have been, you know, specific taverns that are named or, you know, landmarks and monuments and, and houses. So you have a real feel for the place. 
And the brothel, um, once I had the idea, so initially, because, I mean, the brothel is one of the most famous and evocative buildings on the site. It's it's the most visited as well. Hmm. And it, it, it's a really powerful place. You feel it's impossible not to have quite a visceral reaction to it, I think, um, because you, you there are these five tiny cells, there's the corridor, there's the paintings. Um, it's mm. still quite an oppressive space even today, but also a really intriguing one. And I at first kind of dismissed the idea that I'd write, um, you know, start the book in the brothel because, you know, there's just so many cliches and prejudices. Um, but as soon as I thought that, I was like, right, that's why I have to write it because sex workers are still so stigmatized today. Uh, they were even more stigmatized um, back in the Roman era. Well, it, they were stigmatized in a different a different way, but still, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, nobody was interested in their point of view of the world. And yet, in one part, form or another, um, sex work has been so much a part of women's history, not even people who are prostituted, but, you know, women have not had agency over their sexual lives or identities for such a long time um, that it felt like the perfect place to think about that and to write about that and to write a book about the brothel in Pompeii that no one would expect to look at it from a different point of view not titillating not kind of making fun of the girls all kind of giggling and you know that all rather awful cliche that you get um, from a male-dominated view so that was why really even just getting a few chapters into your book, though, it was so clear what you were doing. And I just have to say to you, I absolutely loved it. Oh, thank you. Oh, I I absolutely loved it. It was, I love your characters, but it just the way the story is told to really drew me in. And I just kept reading, which was good because I read almost all of it yesterday, I'll admit, but it made it pretty easy to read it all (laughs) in one day because I was like, well, great, at least I'm loving it. And I like can't put it down. It was really interesting the way that's covered. And my experience with ancient Rome is I don't, I mean, I, I did a classics degree. And so I did cover Rome. You know, we, we covered both pretty equally in my degree, um, which I did alongside English too. So it was sort of, you know, I think with, with an English degree, you get really into both as well, because in the, the English they have you read, there's so many classical references that if you're also interested in classics, it makes your life a lot yes, easier. Yes, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. And so, you know, I have a a grounding in ancient Rome, but primarily lately, all I really know is that I obsessively watch the stars TV show Spartacus, which I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't, but I've heard it's great. I mean, especially based on your book, I would highly recommend it. But it it also takes place like not in Pompeii, but nearby ish. And so I think you get a lot of like the similar kind of visceral and like, dirty violence kind of (laughs) feeling I felt such a similar thing in your book because I mean that's so obviously what it would have been back then but I kept going back to that in my head it helps that I watch it too often but I think uh, it's just such an interesting uh, uh, period to cover but then yeah specifically to go into the lives of these women who were so stigmatized and marginalized and I mean certainly in ancient Rome were straight up enslaved and so you know had so little control and I think you covered so many different characters in that way and so many different types of of lives, you know, women who were born into slavery, others who were, you know, abducted into it or sold into it. Where did you find the inspiration for all of their different stories? So I wanted to try and, although the book is primarily about Amara, the central Mm -hmm. protagonist, and it's really almost like an adventure story of her journey to get out of the brothel to find her freedom, Um, I wanted to reflect some of the different experiences that women were likely to have and the different reactions, the different ways that we all try to survive, really. So, you know, some one particular character, Victoria, who's based actually on the graffiti in the brothel. So there was Mm. a Victoria who refers to herself as Victoria the Conqueror. You know, she writes quite sort of trying to think of, of the right word, but she's She's finding a way to glorify herself in in an environment where a lot of the graffiti is like, I fucked loads of women here type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's taking some control over it in the way that she refers to herself as a conqueress. So, you know, for some women, they will have, if not embraced it, have had a certain pride in what they were doing, of being good at it. But I did feel that was more a view that's been covered 
um, before in some ways. That's more the kind of cliche, but I wanted to acknowledge that. And then, you know, it's just the different experiences. They, they all would have come from different parts of the empire. They would have had very different backgrounds and yet still make close friendships. That was another thing I wanted to do was to show them having a laugh laughing at the men if you go into the brothel today you know it's quite a sort of um carnival atmosphere you know people are laughing oh naughty paintings on the wall you know we all do it there's nothing particularly wrong with it but it's still quite objectifying even today you know mm-hmm. it's like let's have a laugh at the brothel I wanted the women to be laughing back in a way together um the way people do when they face hardship so you know I guess it, I took aspects of personalities from my friends but I did I did kind of base it on the type of storylines that women might actually have had at that time, the roots they might have found themselves into um, slavery, really. As you say, many people would have been abducted. Some would have been unlucky enough to be sold if they fell on really hard times and others would have been born to it. And I do think that those different perspectives would have made people react quite differently. I mean, Dido in particular, who's abducted, has the hardest time adjusting because it's completely alien to what she expected to get from her life um for Amara too you know it's obviously um she was sold by her family uh, when they lost all their money so that's also not the life that she was expecting but she's had a bit more time to get used to what's happened than Dido well and you have them so much from such different regions too sort of exemplifying how broad the Roman Empire was in that time when it comes to the enslaved people because of course dido is as many could tell from her name she is from carthage um and amar is from greece and berenike is from egypt and so it was it was interesting to have all of those different aspects as well and all the different sort of places that that these people can come from especially during that time in the roman world you know the romans sort of looked um at at racial difference completely differently to Mm -hmm. to the modern world as well so they could be very xenophobic and prejudiced about about different nations but they the concept of racism as anti-blackness didn't exist at that time so that was also quite interesting to think about too Mm -hmm. yeah that's something i try to mention as often as I can in my podcast I mean I cover mostly Greek mythology so it often doesn't come up but I mean at the same time I suppose it does just because of all the different regions there as well but yes they were and Greeks in the same way they were deeply xenophobic and like absolutely problematic in so many different ways but it wasn't really about your skin color it was more about where you came from in relation to either Greece or Rome in that case it was more just sort of how Roman were you was the prejudice versus versus anything that we would consider racist. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they had no concept of of black or white as mm-hmm. which is a very sort of modern unscientific concept anyway. But um, Absolutely. yeah, it didn't exist then. So yeah. And it's so interesting and cover all these the different people where they're from versus the the different xenophobic aspects that might come separately of that. So other than like clearly you've been to Pompeii, I I've been to Rome a bunch and I've never been to Pompeii. It's like one of the highest things on my list for when I would love travel again. I cannot wait. Like it's yeah, I've been to Rome enough, but it was never there long enough to be able to, to travel. Um, But the moment we can travel again, I'm going over to Italy and I'm going to Greece. We're going to see literally everything. Um, But other than, than the physical aspects of Pompeii and what you can actually see, like, did you have certain, specific sources you found like the most research or inspiration in I mean I'm sure you read a lot especially if you are able to read Latin and all the original text and everything I have to be honest my Latin's pretty rusty now to be reading whole texts and in the language like at the odd you know the graffiti (laughs) graffiti that I had you know a crib sheet from was was kind of more my level I must admit but and stuff that I'd read already yeah, <laughs> I don't understand any. Uh, it's my like sore point that I don't know Greek or Latin. So, <laughs> well, I don't think you need to to appreciate the stories at all. No. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, of the inspiration did actually come from the original literature, mm. um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I can't sort of not acknowledge the amazing um, books that I read as part of the research. Mary Beard's Pompeii. Also, really. Um, love a classical writer called Daisy Dunn. She wrote In the Shadow of Vesuvius, which is about the two Plinies. Um, She's also written about Catullus. I mean, I didn't use the Catullus um, book for research, but she just writes very beautifully about the ancient world. And then a really fascinating book 
by Robert Knapp called Invisible Romans, which looks at what the interior psychological world of an enslaved person at that that time might have been, Mm. um, which was really interesting um, for me in trying to do that, um, because he goes to sort of the original sources that survive that are not written about slaves, but are in some sense by them. But really, you know, the actual original text, so Ovid's Art of Love, um, which is kind of a, you know, it's very funny, um, but it's also a bit of a pickup artist manual as well. You know, it's a very deeply cynical <laughs> attitude to love. Yeah. It's the sort of thing that you might get of men are from Mars and women are from Venus type cliche of sexual relations. But obviously, there must be something in there in terms of how to manipulate people. Um, so I used that because obviously, for Amara, what she's trying to do is find a patron who will have enough attachment to her that she can get out of where she is. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, there's a book called um, The Satyricon by Petronius, which is set in that part of, of the world, if not Pompeii, you know, around there. And I sort of deliberately riffed on some of his um, set pieces, like Trimalchio's Feast. But again, that's sort of making fun of this awful nouveau riche guy, Trimalchio. I mean, it's a brilliantly funny piece of writing. But I wanted to think, okay, well, what if it's not the freedman who's the butt of the joke? What if it's the the people laughing at him because he's a freedman? How would Amara see that going into that environment as an entertainer, as an enslaved entertainer, seeing how the guests are kind of laughing at, at the host up their sleeves? And mm-hmm. I called him Zoilus. And that's also borrowed from a, a Latin text because Marshall makes fun of a, a, a similar, is, is a kind of stock Roman joke to mock the freedman. And I had him sort of as a a ridiculous but very insecure character. So pretty much every chapter is steeped one way or another in the sort of textual background of that period. The graffiti was also a huge, huge inspiration for me. You know, not just the individual phrases which tell you so much about daily life. I mean, there's some hilarious stuff in there. Um, It's just the lightness of touch, the wittiness of it. Uh, and it's so alive and vibrant. I really wanted to capture that in, in the characters, that people are enjoying their lives as much as they can, regardless of the environment. I mean, just a couple of examples. There's um, somebody's written, lovers like bees live a honeyed life on the wall, and somebody else has scrawled underneath, underneath I wish. <laughs> and, you know, you go to a bar and like these two guys have like scrawled graffiti about how much they fancy the barmaid, Iris. And then one of them insulting the other saying, don't muscle in, I'm better looking than you. And I mean, there's just so much stuff all over the walls of people Mm -hmm. with their beefs and their bragging and their fights. And it's just, you could get lost down there. And I have many times Mm -hmm. (laughs) got lost in the graffiti of Pompeii. You know, a lot of the love stuff is really, really touching. Some of it's funny, some of it's very graphic. Um, They really didn't shy away from writing graphic stuff Mm -hmm. not in Pompeii especially yeah no not in Pompeii (laughs) but you know there's some quite beautiful love poetry on the walls as well uh, and quite sincere expressions of devotion between people there's a slave girl who you know writes um as Methe has left some of her graffiti expressing her love for a guy who may well also have been enslaved and you know praying for Venus to give them good fortune Um, Mm -hmm. which was also partly the inspiration for Amara's genuine romantic relationship in the book rather than one that's for kind of profit or power. Mm -hmm. I loved that one. A peek behind the curtain. We've been talking off off mic about how much to spoil or not to spoil, but the character of Pliny is in your book. Can you tell us however much you want to about the character of Pliny being in the Wolf Den? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really wanted to put Pliny the Elder in there because um, you know he's famous for the role he played in the eruption. He tried to launch a rescue mission and um, died in the attempt. That's hopefully not a spoiler, as it's part of the historical record. <laughs> 
so Amara, in her journey out of the Lupana, the wolf den, um, and I should probably pause at this point to say that the title wolf den actually comes from the fact that the Roman word for brothel and wolf den was the same, Lupana. So she escapes um, some of her time from there by uh, being hired out to dinner parties of wealthier members of Pompeii. Um, and that's kind of combining slightly pushing it on my part you know some prostituted women would have been entertainers like that um playing you know lyres or kitherers or flutes or whatever um and because she was originally free i had it that she knew how to play the lyre and she's rented out to parties and she meets Pliny the elder and i had great fun with his character um we don't know a huge amount of, about Pliny. i did read daisy dunn's um book about him and Pliny the Younger, but you get such a sense of his character from his own writings, particularly the natural history. He's this wonderful mixture of so intelligent and interesting and reflective on life, and then at other times just horribly pompous. Mm. Um, and um, I just love the idea of a character like that. I mean, he he writes quite fascinatingly about his sort of belief in the afterlife, i.e. that there wasn't one, which was quite rare at this time, and how he comes to term with the idea of mortality. Um, so he's a really interesting thinker in so many ways. And he was just a massively curious man. You know, and we do know that for some of his research into the natural history, he interviewed and spoke to courtesans mm. um, to learn about their lives, because he was literally interested in everything. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely fit. It it felt so natural to have him just be that interested based on everything that he is so famous for having written. And of course, yeah, for the location he is so famous for having been, you know, situated in being Pompeii around that, you know, the, the time of the eruption. Well, that leads to sort of your the future of this. So this is the first in a trilogy. Is Is it all meant to revolve around Amara? Or what's the what's the plan there? So it is primarily Amara's story for the trilogy. It's really mm. hard to talk about it without spoiling it. Yeah, um, you don't have to say too much. But the fact that there is a trilogy and, and that's sort of the intention. It, it is a trilogy. And, you know, the sort of themes of what I'm exploring in terms of the role of freed, freed men and women and enslaved men and women and what that looked like, what the Roman world looked like from their point of view is very much a theme that uh, I'm continuing and you know much like the wolf den although Amara is the main character I really saw it as a sort of ensemble Mm -hmm. piece like all five women and then later Britannica who joins them Um, they're all really important characters in their own right so that continues as well through the good yeah I I really enjoyed that bit of it because as much as it is about Amara it is so very much about all of the other women in there and then even you know Felix they're the man who owns them and and so many different little characters in there it's quite well rounded in that way yeah the Felix Amara relationship is really key to the whole trilogy Mm. as well that kind of very intense on her part um, hatred and yet they they have a connection because they're quite similar Mm -hmm. yeah he's he's got some complexities that come out and make him so much more interesting for sure we won't say too much about it but it's nice when when a character who is so bad, obviously, based on just the situation, but has those complexities, you know, it isn't just straight cut and dry. That was really something I wanted to get across. He's not a cardboard villain. He does some terrible things and I don't have sympathy for him mm-hmm. for the terrible things he does. And it's not an excuse, but ultimately, and certainly as we know more about Felix as the trilogy goes on, you know, people have such limited choices sometimes in their lives and sometimes there are literally no good choices I mean he's picked some particularly awful ones (laughs) within the limited choices he has which is why he doesn't deserve too many excuses Um, but equally you know a lot of people start off and that's the same today with very few choices open to them that are going to leave them with their integrity intact Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it just makes for such a more compelling you know quote unquote villain if that's what he really is to to have those different the the ways you can see how he got for the most part to where he is like you say there's definitely some choices where he did not have to go that <laughs> that dark or he did not have to <laughs> no. be that bad but yeah he's quite interesting oh i feel like this is somewhat come up already in the way you spoke about it at the beginning but how much did you take into consideration the 
modern understanding of sex workers and the way that they are stigmatized and you know how much did that kind of influence the story you were telling so it's really it's a really interesting question and I did think about it a lot although I have to say when I wrote the book I decided to kind of have that as background thinking for myself mm-hmm. and to focus really on the circumstances then and that also went for how I built the characters so Amara is a very strong character and she has this enormous passion to be free and to have some control over her life but I didn't make her a feminist because that would just have been too anachronistic so I tried to base her longings on things that would be recognizable for the time I mean slaves wanted to to become freed people Mm -hmm. you know it was a possibility in life and of course that was the aim to become a freed man or a freed woman and so to have her kind of quite scheming and um, ruthless to get there didn't feel like a, a push in terms of your question about sex work and sex workers I think the overlap really for me is is in the perception and in ancient Rome there was no stigma really or or not not anything like the same stigma for a man to in quotes use a prostitute and I'm using the word prostitute rather than sex worker simply because we're talking about people who were prostituted they didn't have any choice in what they were Mm -hmm. doing but there was a lot of stigma to prostituted women So it's different in our era that prostitution was accepted as a normal state of affairs um, and not just sex workers, you know, um, people who work domestically within the household were just free game. I quote a piece of graffiti from Pompeii, which is use your slave girl whenever you wish. It's your right, Mm. Um, which is awful. Mm -hmm. It's horrifying. Yeah, it is. But this was the attitude of the time. So that is different from now. But I do think this kind of way that people's own sense of shame or what is or isn't okay is projected on to people who sell sex. And I think that there's that similarity. Um, A lot of the dangers of the life have not gone away. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's even to a certain extent, the, the sort of higher up the chain you go, sort of women who... I would consider, you could use the term sex worker, women like Drusilla, who are freed women, Mm -hmm. who are running it like a a business. Yes, they may not have had many choices as to why they ran that particular business, um, but it is still a completely, completely different life to Amara and the women being run by their pimp in the brothel. I feel like I've kind of not quite conveyed what what you were asking or what I wanted to say. I guess in terms of the prejudice, I feel like there is still a prejudice today because of how we view sex workers today as to how the women in that brothel back then are viewed now. Mm -hmm. So I think the same kind of sense that they're not really worth anything, that they're just about sex. That was the other thing. You know, sex is just a part of life. Because they were in a brothel does not mean that the whole book is about sex or their whole lives were about sex. Mm -hmm. It's just not like that. And I wanted to not have graphic scenes in there um, which I hope I avoided Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah you know going around the brothel as a tourist and just the way it's kind of a bit of a joke it just feels quite like the women are still not granted that humanity Mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted to find in writing about it well I even think just the way that they are covered so empathetically sort of just immediately translates to the the issues today because just the idea that you know that that they are we're we're hearing this story of the women as if they are the main characters as if obviously like this is not their whole lives this is not you know anything that deserves any kind of judgment I think automatically sort of translates to today where where obviously like you're saying it's very different these women are prostituted versus versus sex work but just even the idea of of telling their story yeah I think just the the telling of their story in general kind of conveys enough of a you're just sort of you are telling their story in a way that that sort of makes a a point for today as well and that's that's just absolutely what I wanted to convey and that it shouldn't be that you know my reaction when I first thought about well why don't I write a book that looks at the lives of the women in the Lupana I was like oh well I can't do that why is that my initial reaction why is Mm -hmm. the initial reaction of anybody 
hearing about my book, thinking it's going to be a particular kind of book. It's because of all this stigma that just still weighs down mm -hmm. on, on, on our perceptions of people. Um, when one of my absolute favourite books, The Mercies by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, mm. which is about women, you know, facing the witch trials uh, back in, uh, I think it's the 17th century. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sexual violence in that and a lack of sexual agency in that, but nobody would think of the women in that situation as sexualized in the way that they would about the women in the Lupana, even though the experiences are, are very similar. So I guess there was that as well. Like, why are they considered a different category of person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think, again, like even when I you know first heard about the book, I was like, you know, this can go kind of one of two ways. And fortunately, like it went in exactly the way that I think is so perfect and important of just telling the story because it's a story that deserves to be told, not because it, it's, you know, in need of like a retelling that that just sort of emphasizes all the sexual aspects or all the ways that they were, what's the word I want? Just, I mean, just the, the idea that they were enslaved. Like you're not glorifying that at all. It's very no. much just an examination of these people as their lives and the horror of that, but also just that that's their life and this is kind of how they went about it. Yes, exactly. And then the other aspects of their lives, how they would have found you know, comfort and laughter, and they would have been whole people, they could have been funny, as you know, as many of the characters are, they would have loved, they would have wanted more for themselves, because everybody does, and they deserve to be looked at with that respect, I think. And also, you know, thinking very much about mythology from that period, there's so many, I mean, you've written a whole book on it, it's practically like all the women that Zeus raped, you know, it's just so endemic to that period that women are just kind of used and they're objectified. And yeah, I just wanted to look at that from from a different point of view. So which, you know, a lot of writers are doing really brilliantly in retelling myths, but I wanted to not look at a myth this time around, but look at actual life. Yeah, and I think that's so equally important. And there are so many books that are, yeah, retellings of mythology in that kind of way, but to have one that is like a real yeah, real situation that people really found them in, I think, says a lot about the history and the myths. Because like you say, I mean, that is the entirety of my career at this point is just <laughs> talking about the ways in which women are mistreated, not necessarily 100% in the cultures, but in the way we see the cultures because of the sourcing we have that remains and the mythology that we have that remains and all those different things. So I think, yeah, looking at the ways that that would have affected real people especially in a place like Pompeii where we do have all of this evidence it does seem like yes. such a perfect way to do it because the thing about Pompeii and this is so just to get this out even just to my listeners who are constantly hearing me talk about what we have being the extant sources the sources that have survived i.e the ones that they deemed worthy of survival or just randomly survived the thing about Pompeii because we it's just the real place you have graffiti you have the paintings on the walls all these things that we don't otherwise have for other regions so you get it's much more of a truth than uh yes than stories and that's how we have the brothel because nobody would have bothered to preserve a brothel mm -hmm, for 2000 that's years so true. But because the volcano erupted on it there it is the only surviving brothel from the ancient world so yeah, there's just so much that came out of just the like, definitely not luck for the people in it, but certainly no. luck for us now that, yeah, that just Vesuvius did preserve so much of that world. And we have all of those really real aspects. I never think enough about the graffiti. And now it's kind of all I want to know about just all those, the things that real people just wrote down. But there's so many myths on the walls as well. And mm. I think that's quite a nice reminder in Pompeii of just how real the mythical characters and stories were to them, how they may well have projected themselves into those stories or reflected on them. They were all around, um, you know, Pompeii was um, the town of Venus. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about the goddess of love, lots of stories about Venus, Hercules, um, because, you know, there's like this legend that he was at Herculaneum there's lots of stuff about Hercules there. Um, and then, yeah, just Leader and the Swan. I was going to say, that's the one that stood out to me most is that, yeah, yeah you, you 
make mention of Lita and the Swan in in some of the wall paintings, which was interesting. Yeah, that's 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 such a problematic story as well. <laughs> so that's why I stuck it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of perfect for that, you know. I mean, among so many other Greek yeah. myths, but that's certainly one of the most weird and troubling ones. So yeah. many are troubling, but they don't have that level of swans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's a lot of kind of um, Medusa, Perseus, mm. um, Ariadne and Theseus. It's, it's, it's quite wonderful that you don't need to, you know, my Latin's not good enough to be reading the graffiti off the walls, particularly, except maybe in one or two really obvious examples. But you can read the stories. They don't need words. You know, you can mm-hmm. recognize the myths. You know, even a little fragment that I particularly loved because it's so impressionistic. You can see it's, oh, that's Odysseus having his feet washed by his nurse. You know, mm. It's just kind of, I love that about Pompeii. And the and the floors as well, the mosaics are just extraordinary. Oh, God. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. They did love gorgons in yes. that kind of time period <laughs> in Rome, so or in the Roman Empire, rather. So I can imagine there's a lot of good gorgon iconography and actually a lot of sexual paintings the brothel um, Mm. images are almost tame compared to some of the other stuff that wasn't even in brothels you know it's just like on somebody's wall so (laughs) it it, i mean it's such a such a fascinating thing about the ancient world is how much they were interested in in sex and all of that i mean i was on Twitter today and a lot of some people I follow participate in phallus Thursday. And it's just <laughs> like posting art from either ancient Greece or Rome about their really excessive use <laughs> of phallic imagery in whatever way. And so, I mean, yeah, it certainly Greece did it similarly with their, even just with the, the city Dionysia, the most important festival in Athens. They just like walk around with these enormous penises on <laughs> on sticks basically just like raising them high up in the air yeah it's a fascinating thing and then to go and look at it now and somewhere like Pompeii or you just really see it for real and not just on pottery and things like that it yeah Yeah, all over the streets across a bakery you know just everywhere yeah yeah, all over the place (laughs) they they were they were everywhere so they they were used for a variety of reasons I mean sometimes it's kind of like um, a good luck charm or warding off the evil eye or a sign Mm -hmm. of prosperity and fertility you know like in a business like a bakery or whatever but sometimes I think it's almost like a mark of sexual aggression Um, Mm. so it could be used in a garden like a a form of priapus to warn people away like a a, a threat of rape basically I will come and get you with my enormous scary looking penis and I just think it underlines how much it was a man's world. Yeah. Because there is this kind of macho posturing everywhere. Um, and it, you know, some historians kind of go the other way and are like, oh, it's not just that it's not guiding people to brothels. It's like it's not sexualized at all. And I just think that's a really unrealistic. They are still mm-hmm. a bunch of erect penises plastered all over everything. And secondly, there's a poem in Marshall where he says a well brought up girl will avert her eyes. And I just thought that was, where is she going to look then? How's a woman going to walk down the street averting her eyes every five minutes? There are so many dicks out. And that just made me think, wow, this was not a world designed (laughs) with women in mind. You know, they're not meant to look at anything. And Roman women, unlike Greek women, were very much out and about and integrated. And, you know, they weren't stuck in the house. Yeah, that's so true. I can't imagine how how they would not be meant to be sexualized. It's not like they're not erect. Like if no. they were, if there was just like phalluses everywhere that were, you know, all sad looking, like I can imagine <laughs> that it was for some other reason, but yeah, that you have these enormous erect phalluses like they're, yeah, there's clearly an intention there that I think can't be avoided. Yeah, I think so. I mean, some of them, I think, are quite meant to be humorous as well. Like the lamps Certainly. that I had in the brothel. Yes, I really enjoyed the lamps. <laughs> those, those are real. <laughs> they, they oh, really I, that, I, <laughs> no part of me doubted that. I was like, that sounds like Rome. That absolutely yeah. sounds like Rome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> what a kind of perfect way to start wrapping it up. I think I won't take up too much of your night. Um, but is there anything that, that um, anything specific about the story that, that you want to convey to my listeners that you want to mention otherwise? I guess just that, 
you know, I did reflect a lot on wanting to tell the stories of women who'd been silenced. And I thought very seriously about um, enslavement and what that might have meant in that period of time. But also, this isn't a grim book. So I would really want readers mm. to take that away. That It's a very, um, you know, I hope there's a lot of humour in it, a lot of hope and a lot of colour from Pompeii, a lot of graffiti, in fact. So <laughs> um, I Absolutely. Would hope that people would take that away from the book. Yeah, and that'll be included in my introduction as well. I should make that clear up front. No, but I absolutely, I mean, I think it has those dark points because it needs to, but it's absolutely like, yeah, just a, it's a overall it, very enjoyable. It didn't doesn't bring you down. It ha, it shows like all sides to their lives and shows a lot of good that I think you wouldn't necessarily assume that could be found in that world. But of course, you know, people have to find good in whatever lives that they're I, given. I think that's exactly the point that, you know, people make their lives about what they can, really. And, you know, a lot of people are stuck with really crap jobs and unideal situations, and they find their happiness and their humor in other ways. Yeah, exactly. And I think, yeah, it, it's important to make that clear, especially in an ancient world where where you just sort of assume the worst a lot, or certainly I often portray the worst when it comes to talking about women in that time. And so I think, I think your book's a perfect kind of counter to that too, seeing that they were certainly marginalized and treated poorly in those ways, but they were able to kind of find lightness and find happiness in their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been such a pleasure. It's so appreciated. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me on your fab podcast. It's been brilliant. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. Elodie's book comes out next week from when the time this episode drops, though we did record the episode a number of weeks ago now. There is a link to that Blackwell's uh, website that I mentioned in the episode's description. Thank you all so much for listening. I, I really am so thrilled with this episode. I learned so much about Pompeii and Roman history. Ugh, it's always just so much fun when we get to talk about things that I'm not super familiar with. Like just so much to learn all the time. Anyway, I'm just a huge nerd. Thank you all again. You are all the best. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm -hmm.